Hello, good afternoon, good lunch hour, good morning, depending on where you are. This is Adam Schaffner from Adsona. You are in the right place at the right time. Um, I'm sorry there's no hold music to keep you entertained, but we are really excited that you took some time out of your day to join us for this webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about tracking and conversions, tips and tricks to ensure your advertiser dollars are working. I hate to call them tricks. It's not magic, but it can be tricky sometimes, and we'll talk about that. But I am the Chief Product Officer at Adcelerant. I am joined by my esteemed colleague, Adam Lee, whose forename in quality is only surpassed by the quality of his character. Adam, why don't you say something about yourself and get us started? Sure. Um, I think one of the biggest things y'all should know is that I have a tough time operating Zoom meetings, still four months into the quarantine, and I'm figuring it out. Um, hopefully soon. Uh, but uh, my name is Adam Lee. I'm the president of Tekent Labs. Uh, we are an advertising agency that really focuses on, um, you know, performance or conversion based metrics. So we work with a lot of e-commerce companies uh, that really demand quite a bit of tracking and analytics and super excited to join you here today, Mr. Schaffner. Um, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. So today, uh, you know, we're we're going to be going through a, a pretty light agenda. However, you know, there some of these topics can really get sticky quickly, and so we're going to try to keep it fairly high level today. However, you know, we're going to be sending out this webinar, the recording after uh, it's been completed today. Uh, if you have any questions, please place them in the Q and A. We are going to answer them at the end. Uh, and so first and foremost, we're going to go through uh, the company and, and what we do and, and why we might be, you know, some sort of authority to speak on this topic. We're going to get into what conversions are, how do we define them? Why is this important? What does this mean to your business? Why is this something that you or your clients should be spending time on? What are best practices? What does tech look like? We know that it's changing and rapidly evolving. Um, there's things that that uh, you know are happening here in the near future that I'm sure some of you are wondering about, and we'll touch on all of those. Um, how to track pixels and and containers? What does that look like? It can often be confusing, and we hope to make that confusing piece very simple to understand today. We are also are going to talk about some additional analytics that you can use to your advantage as you're managing yours or your clients' campaigns, some common pitfalls, things that you maybe want to avoid uh, as you're going through the day-to-day -day of your business, what can happen if you do it right, so a success story, and then at the end, we'll get into some questions. Did I miss anything there, Adam? No, that sounds great. Thanks, Adam. Awesome. Well, um, Adcelerant is a technology and digital advertising company focused on making quality digital marketing accessible to every business. I've been working with Adcelerant for a number of years now, and it is uh, you know, just one of the best companies I've ever worked with. They're really supportive in what they do for their clients and partners, and it's something that has really helped move Tech and Labs forward, uh, as well as the clients that, that we work with. So we're an award-winning technology and digital marketing company. And, and really, you know, there's so many things out there. As I mentioned, the landscape is ever evolving. And we want to make sure that, that, you know, everybody on Main Street, not just Madison Avenue, can take advantage of this great technology and the tips and tricks that, that go along with that. Speaking of technology, Adcellerin has a proprietary total digital agency software solution that helps our partners scale sales, operations, and reporting within a single toolkit. Makes it super easy to activate digital sales and, and really help your clients uh, along the way. Adcelerant was recognized as the 83rd fastest growing company in the US on the Inc. Magazine, Inc. 5000 list, 
and we're proud to be the preferred programmatic solution of the local media consortium. So not only do we want to help local businesses, but we really aim to help local publishers as well and make sure that we're affording every business in the community an opportunity to have access to this great technology and solutions to help them move their business forward. And in today's environment, it's more important than ever to be efficient with your marketing. And that's really what Adcelerant does. Uh, but it wouldn't be a great company and wouldn't offer a great solution if it wasn't the team of individuals behind the scenes. So there's over 80 individuals who are purposeful in their ex ex execution uh, of the company's mission. So, you know, from teams to um, executive to business development, account management, agency services, product, uh, product and technology and operations, which is really the backbone of what we do. And that's going to be something that we talk about today because it's those folks who really help get your tracking data analytics all set up so you can use it and make sure that it's actionable when, when the data starts flowing through. Um, and lastly, we have a partner network of over 300 local media partners and ad agencies. So, if you are thinking about working with Adcelerant or already do work with Adcelerant, you know that this is truly a solution for any business of any size and we can truly help you scale your business. Thanks, Adam. And just to quickly talk about what we do for our partners. I mean, at, at our heart, we are a, a services and customer service company, but we love technology, we embrace it, we're all about it. We want to be on the cutting edge. Um, as much technology that is off the shelf that is out there that we have come across, um, you know, none of it was really the best fit for our business. So what we pride ourselves on is our, one of the things we pride ourselves on is our, our engineering team. So they, we have proprietary software that helps in the sales process as far as um, putting together proposals and reports and execution, automating what we can without becoming too set it and forget it and robotic. So really a marriage of that really awesome customer service, that human brain, that critical thinker, as well as taking advantage of all the efficiencies and really cool things that algorithms and technology can do for us. So we, we like to combine the cutting edge technology, the professional services, that customer service, that's what we pride ourselves on. And like Adam mentioned before, advanced advertising. So through the power of scaling all of our partners, no matter how large or small they are, we're actually able to access technologies that you wouldn't normally be able to access as a small brand. You know, if you're not Pepsi or Walmart, you know, you can't necessarily always access the best and newest technology that's out there. But through our collective buying power, we can actually get access to that and make it available to everybody. So that's what we mean by making that Madison Avenue level advertising available down to that Main Street partner. And so it's important, I think, since we're talking about analytics and conversions and proving the value of our campaigns, what is a conversion? I, I hope that you are all somewhat familiar with this term. It can mean a number of different things. The way I like to define it, in digital marketing is that it's a trackable action taken by a person after being exposed to a marketing message. Sounds simple, but it could be a number of different metrics that you're looking at. And I like to break these down into online conversions and offline conversions. So actions that you take on the web and actions that you take when you're not online. So online conversions, this isn't all encompassing, but these are some really common online conversions that we look at sales you know, either number of sales or even better if you have the revenue tied to those sales, that's really awesome. Leads, phone calls, page views. Sometimes you're really just trying to drive traffic to your website. Um, we're gonna get into some examples of why you would pick one over the other later in this presentation. Um, but form fills reservations, just different examples of online conversions. And then there's actually a lot of offline conversions that we can tie to an online marketing effort. Um, CRM matchbacks, for example, you know, taking a, a list of everyone that bought a car at your dealership, matching their address up with an online identifier, knowing that we serve them an ad, or we can do some cool brick and mortar location visit attribution tied to the mobile uh, location history 
that is on all of our iPhones that we, or you know, mobile phones that we carry in our pockets every day. So we'll talk about both of those in a little bit more depth. But a conversion can be really any of these things. It's just something that you're tracking beyond that impression or the click or those you know, really basic you know, ad server metrics. We're going one level deeper to show like, is it actually affecting my business? Don't just take the ad server's word for it, but let's look at some other things to prove that it's actually having an impact on our, our, on our business. And Adam, that's great. You know, in, in all the clients and campaigns that you and your team work with, I mean, how, how prevalent is this? I mean, are you getting questions about this type of tracking on a regular basis? Is it something, something that most companies are taking advantage of? You know, what, what are you seeing as it relates to, to, you know, this type of conversation? You know, surprisingly, I think it's a, it's often a point of friction and, and we'll get into some of why that is, but, you know, getting the technology set up to really take advantage of these metrics and all of the cool analytics that come with it can be difficult if you're working with an advertiser that's not as, you know, web savvy or tech savvy, but, you know, we are seeing, you know, all all signs point to the entire industry is pointing towards conversions versus just looking at a click-through rate or an impression. So, I mean, if you're not already here, this is the time to embrace the future. This is how you want to be running your marketing efforts. So we wanna make sure to explain to you guys why it's so important that we, do, we track these things and know that these are available. And, and oftentimes, you know, these pixels or tracking mechanisms can sometimes be confusing, but um, really they're, they're somewhat easy to understand once you wrap your head around it, right? I think so. Um, you know, it's really just about trying to understand it the best you can to make sure your advertiser knows why it's so important. Um, and, and it can be nuanced and detailed depending on what website you're trying to work with, but it is so important. It can really, it can really bring so much more value to what you're doing on the marketing side that you will have a much better retention rate when you're able to prove this versus not doing any of this and just relying on those ad server metrics like clicks and impressions. So this is really important for your long-term play for growing your business, getting those renewals, retaining clients, et cetera. Great. Yeah, and, and so just to talk about how are we tracking conversions, you know, to break it down into the online and offline space, online conversions are typically tracked through what are called pixels. And that's kind of like a, a colloquial term that not every tracking tag nowadays is an actual pixel. Often they are some snippet of HTML code or JavaScript um, that we pass to you to give to your advertiser, uh, but we still call it a pixel. It's just kind of the household name for a tracking tag. And they put the advertiser puts this on their website and then anyone that visits that website, this pixel or tracking tag is looking at that user looking at their cookies and, and asking those cookies, hey, have you been served an ad from our marketing campaign and did you click on that ad? And then what are you doing after you land on my page? So it's, it's able to really ask these questions behind the scenes of what the user is doing on a site. So, I mean, there's so much information that this can pass back that's valuable. So sales and revenue amounts, like I mentioned before, so you can actually tie um, real dollars and cents to your advertising campaign and know it. You know, what am I paying per sale? What's my incremental lift in actual revenue? Uh, we can track what URLs were visited. So um, did they go to the locations page, the menu page, the thank you page? Did they go to eight pages? Did they get on the landing page and just leave immediately? That's really valuable information. Did they click on the ad or not? This is really cool because even if they don't click on an ad, we can serve them an ad and if they end up, you know, searching for your website or your brand later, um, and they still have that cookie enabled, we can track them through what's called a post impression conversion. So they might not have to click on it, but they'll still end up going to your website and engaging with your brand. And that's not something you can see through a good click through rate or a bad click through rate. Um, it doesn't matter. So you can, this is additional value that you can show your advertisers because not everyone clicks on ads all the time. I know I definitely don't do that personally. And I know a lot of other people don't just click on ads all day long. So it's but not that, always about the click, but do you retain that brand name? Do you end up researching that brand later? That is so cool. Um, and you can only do that by having that pixel placed on the advertiser site. So you're breaking those conversions down into post click or post impression as we'd call them. 
and so Adam, that really what you're saying is, so if, if I'm served an ad, but I don't click on it, and I open a new tab in Google Chrome and Google somebody's website because I saw that ad, you can actually track that. Absolutely, yeah. So those are gonna be users that you know you can show value for, but unless you have that pixel place, you're not gonna actually be able to show them. Because every time we show someone an advertisement, it actually places a cookie on them. So that, that way we can track them back to the advertiser site and know, you know, did they come back? How many times did they come back? Did, where did they come back to when they did come back? So a lot of really cool things um, that we can learn about the audience just by placing that pixel. That's great. Um, the advertiser campaign info comes back to the ad, for, the ad server. So which creatives were driving the most traffic? Which tactics? Was it the behavioral targeting, the content targeting? What browser were they using? What time of day was it? All of these things are really important, not only for the, the operations team or whoever's running the campaign, you know, they get all this information back to really understand what's performing best in the campaign to optimize it. So they know where to kind of shift those dollars towards whatever that, you know, key uh, performance indicator that KPI is, whether it's conversions or, you know, doesn't matter. We'll get into the different types of conversions. Um, but we really rely on cookies and these tags to pass that information back. And, and then site analytics and campaign parameters. So the, I'm talking about UTM codes and Google analytics, which is really, you know, you know, probably most of you have heard of this, are familiar with it. It's the most common third party free analytic tool. That's a good way to directionally know what's happening um, with the users on your site and then start to see some of that traffic flow in from different marketing sources. Um, so that's kind of the online conversions. Most of these are based with cookies right now. And we'll talk about um, the cookie list future that's being kind of circulated in the news at the end of this. But the, the online conversion is really reliant on placing tags and tracking tags successfully on an advertiser's website. Um, but there's also offline conversions. So just because you serve people ads and they don't engage online, they might come to your store, they might come to your dealership and buy a car. Um, without having done much on your website or going to that purchase on your website. So the offline conversions, the two most common that we'll talk about here, um, the matchback reporting. So for example, if you in the month of June have a list of everyone that bought a car from your dealership, you most likely have their name, phone number and address. Um, and that physical address can actually be linked to a couple different of on online differentiating um, identifiers. So whether it's an IP address or a, a device ID based on their location history, we can tell what users from a digital fingerprint match up to that physical uh, address fingerprint. And that's what matchback reporting is. Um, really seeing like, oh, you know what? We served this guy an ad and he actually bought a car that was worth $35,000. So that is some really great return on investment on my $5,000 campaign, for example. Um, and then point of interest attribution um, is not necessarily tied to a sale amount or an actual purchase, but is tied to a person visiting a physical location that we are able to track with a, you know, an alarming degree of precision um, to a physical location. You know, when we have our location services enabled on all these different apps on our mobile device, many of them are just constantly sending our location back. Um, and sharing it for marketing purposes. And that's something we've all opted into in the terms and conditions. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in the coming that's, slides. That's very, very interesting, Adam. And I know that, you know, that's really, really prevalent that those offline conversion metrics, especially in, you know, those highly transactional or valuable transactional um, type of businesses, like you mentioned, like in, in auto dealership. Um, it's something that, that we're seeing quite a bit um, you know, on the tech side and, and uh, you know, it can really lead to um, some, some, some interesting findings as to where your marketing is actually being valuable to uh, your media mix and to your consumer journey. And so really appreciate the, the tee up there and, and, you know, the, the importance of tracking to your business. I mean, the list is almost endless. We could have a webinar just on this slide because of the amount of value data and analytics and tracking can bring to uh, you know, one's business or, or even boil down further to somebody's marketing mix.
So there's some things that, that we like to call out, you know, first and foremost, when you start to bring tracking into the equation, really what you're doing as a business, or if you're helping a business as a partner, you're taking out the gray area. Oftentimes with just impressions or clicks, it leaves you open to risk to somebody else, um, you know, looking at your campaign metrics and deciding for themselves if it's been successful or not. So what we want to do through these tracking mechanisms is we really want to make that a black and white conversation. Is it working or is it not working? And we want to have the data to back that up and remove that gray area. And once you start to make that a black and white conversation, now that tracking information and data can really lead to, you know, decisions that take place within your marketing sphere and outside of it, just within your business as a whole. And there's a few things here that I specifically want to point out. Um, first and foremost, you know, it can dictate media strategy. You'll see in our case study at the end that, you know, can often help you right size your spends on certain platforms. Other platforms you should be investing more in and some that you need to be pulling back. It really makes your media mix much more efficient if you can truly understand what your marketing dollars are doing for you and your business through those tracking mechanisms. Um, it can also help with overall investment levels and planning. Oftentimes, you know, our clients or our partners' clients, their budgets are arbitrary. And I think it's very powerful to be able to bring a case to somebody and say, hey, this is what the data is telling us. For every dollar you spend, you get $6.17 back. So we should start to increase our budgets to give you a larger return on your marketing. Um, and, and that's a way to help grow your business, as, especially as a, a media partner. Um, you can also start to test creative and messaging. And I you know, mentioned that some of this information can help with decisions both inside of marketing and out. If you are A, B, C, D testing different creative messages, different copy within a platform like Facebook or through imagery that you're using on a display campaign or even copy that you're using within a search campaign, you can start to see what audiences are engaging with and what messages and images they're not engaging with. And so not only can you optimize your marketing campaign, your digital marketing campaign, but now you start to get this really good data that maybe you should update the type, you know, the copy that you have on your homepage. Maybe you should change the type of information that you um, put in, in a brochure that you hand out to your clients at different, you know, trade expos or conferences back when we used to have things like that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different data and intelligence that you can get from tracking what is and isn't working. One of the big things that I do want to call out also is path to conversion um, or even just a piece of attribution. You know, we mentioned earlier, Adam mentioned earlier that, you know, somebody can see an ad, not click on it, and then go to Google and go to your website and we can actually track that one-to-one. -one. Hey, we showed that person an ad and then they ended up on your website five days later and then they made a purchase. Well, if you don't have the proper tracking mechanisms in place, you might look at your display campaign report and say, this didn't do anything for me. I didn't get a click. There's no direct attribution to any sales that I have on my website. That's something that I want to cut out of my media mix. Well, if you just had that, that simple, you know, pixel um, that was tracking the, the post impression behavior, now you'd realize that that display impression was actually crucial or vital to, to getting a new user to your site that actually converted and became a paying customer. And then when you start to look at things like lifetime value of a new customer, that display ad drove immense value to you or your partner's business. But without these tracking mechanisms, you would have never known that and potentially moved away from that and, and made your top of funnel marketing mix um, you know, a little less um, diverse and effective. Um, as, as Adam mentioned, um, you know, valuable targeting segments, understanding, you know, who is engaging and why and, and how you can start to scale that across other platforms and find lookalike audiences and really start to make your marketing 
more efficient. And really, that is the purpose of this tracking. Yes, we want to know what it's doing for you. Am I get a re getting a return on my marketing and advertising? But at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're businesses here. We need to be efficient. We need to make sure that, that we are getting a return for every dollar that we spend. And this types of data and analytics and tracking allows you to truly outsmart and not outspend and become much more efficient uh, as an advertiser. So awesome. thank you. Yeah, Adam. sorry, sorry, Shaf, I was just gonna kick it to you. Yeah, kick it on over here. Um, so we, we wanna talk about some best practices in tech. I think Adam, that was a great overview of why it is so important. It's, there's an endless reason, um, list of reasons why this is amazingly important to your business. But to talk about pixels and tags, this is important. It's, it's really important to know that this will not always go smoothly when you're trying to get a pixel or a tag placed on an advertiser's website. Those of you who are familiar with this already know this. If it is a smooth process for you, please let me know and tell me what your secret is. There's a number of things that can go wrong, but um, these are amazing um, in their functionality and what they can do. So just to call out some of the things, um, for example, we like to use what's called a universal pixel, which is driven by JavaScript. And it's a single pixel that you can place across an entire website. So as opposed to having a different pixel for the sports page and a different pixel for the news page to track those separately, like you know, in the old days, that's how we have to do it or had to do it. Um, now we can place that single piece of tracking tag in the header or footer and it gets pushed out to the website. Um, and it tracks conversions and, you know, site visits and button clicks, et cetera, but it also can perform a number of other really cool things like building a site retargeting pool. So everybody that comes to your website, put them into a pool um, to retarget later with a banner or video advertisement, dynamic retargeting. So this is, you know, something that Amazon kind of blazed the trail for. But you know, you leave that pair of shoes in your shopping cart and you don't buy it. And then, you know, a couple of days later, you see that same pair of shoes, the same color, the same size that you selected, left it in your shopping cart. Uh, but it's on a completely different website as a banner ad. So that's dynamic retargeting. It's it's really using technology to change the creative based on some kind of past behavior, not possible without that pixel being placed. Post impression site traffic again, the users who saw the ad but didn't click on it that conversion and revenue tracking, site analytics, the Google analytics specifically is what we're all familiar with. And then lookalike audience building. So with many ad servers, you can place a pixel um, and it really just collects data on who is visiting the website for a period of time, um, you know, until it reaches some threshold, whether that's 10K unique visitors or 30K unique visitors but it actually profiles them and says, you know, here's the, you know, the most common interests and demographics of the people who have been to your site in the last 30 days. And then you can take that information and build a behavioral or demographic audience around it um, and go after similar looking folks. So the pixel can do so much more than conversions. And we just wanted to call that out. The, you know, another importance of pixels and tracking tags. Um, and it can get kind of daunting, especially for the smaller business um, who is not web savvy. You know, the pizza shop owner who uses their nephew to build their website or their Facebook page has no idea how to do any of this. Um, but once they want to start running, you know, they want to put the Google Analytics tag down and the Facebook tag and they want to run some banners and they want to run some search tags uh, or campaigns. You know, that's four different tags they'd have to play. So that's four different points where there could be an error or something that goes wrong or a break in that, you know, kind of communication flow digitally from that ad campaign back to the results on the website. So we wanted to call out those of you who are not familiar, Google Tag Manager is a, a container tag solution um, that's free and really easy to use. We love it. Um, there's a number of other container tags out there, but you can give the container tag to an advertiser and they place that correctly one time across their site and then they don't have to do anything else again as long as you have access to their tag manager on the back end you can come in and swap out tags you can add as many pixels and tracking tags as you want remove them and you don't have to bother that pizza shop owner every time who you know they're trying to focus on running their business 
And they're typically reaching out to you or us to help them run the digital marketing side of things. So they look, look to us for that. And this really just makes it streamlined and easy. So, um, you know, we really love the tag manager solution, especially when you're doing some kind of multi-platform effort because it just makes it so much easier for the end advertiser. I second that wholeheartedly makes everybody involved, uh, everybody involved life easier if the tag manager's down on the site. Yep. And then, you know, what to track, you know, there's so many things to track as we've mentioned. Um, but for a business, these are some really great things that you would want to highlight if you are able, you know, once you have that long-term campaign running and all these analytics and a history of those analytics, you can show them revenue growth, return on ad spend, the conversion rate, cost per conversion, who's returning, who's new, what's the average order value. So all of these really great um, pieces of business intelligence that you're helping them not only like understand the marketing dollars they're spending are working, but you know, you, you can actually help them understand who their audience is and enhance their business organically and provide additional value besides just showing the value of their marketing and getting them to renew. It's not just about that. It's actually about providing more value and more insight into their business and their audience um, and helping that grow. And typically, Adam, you see when you start to, and, and I know we see that on the tech and lab side, when you start to provide this type of information, the retention rate of your client roster goes through the roof. Yeah, it's insane. When you become that consultant that provides this information and shows this to them, on the regular, it's really hard for them to leave you um, and for good reason. And so I'd love to run through some different examples. Um, you know, we don't have a slide on the sales funnel or the sales life cycle, um, but you know, really quickly just to talk about different portions of a site that you would track depending on what kind of campaign you're running. So for, for example, for a branding campaign, you're really just trying to get new users who don't know who you are to be exposed to your brand name and your logo um, and to kind of remember who you are so that the, if they ever search for your business and they see you, they're more likely to click on you because they've seen your brand and your name before that. So if we're doing a branding campaign, you know, what do we want to track on this site of all these different places that you can click on? What would we want to track? So uh, Adam, next slide. So it's hard to see maybe, but we, we see this red outline across the entire site. Um, if you're doing a branding campaign, you actually really want to look at all site traffic. We want to look for that lift in site traffic. Um, we just want to get people in the door, show them to the site, um, have it in their, their browsing history, um, just get them here, you know, get them familiar with it. That first look, um, you know, this is the first touch. Dental Associates of Aurora is this example. This girl is really excited to get her teeth cleaned and I would love to be that excited when I get my teeth cleaned. I'm not there yet, but maybe I need to hit up Dental Associates of Aurora to make that happen. If you're doing a more of a mid funnel campaign on the informational side, like these people are starting to do their research, right? They wanna know like who works there, what's their reviews, how much do they cost, are they close to my house, et cetera. So what would we track for an informational campaign So you can see meet the team, what services and procedures are provided, what kind of technology do they have access to? Um, you know, are they providing that um, Invisalign kind of stuff on the braces and orthodontics side or not? You know, is that supported by my insurance? What are the testimonials? I'd love to see some pictures of some before and afters of different people's teeth that are getting worked on. You know, as you're making that decision, like who am I gonna work with? You do a lot of this research so in an informational campaign where you have a little bit more targeted tactics and who you're going after, you also want to be a little bit more thoughtful and um, strategic about what you're seeing on the engagement side on a website. So you would put a pixel on this website and then that pixel would tell you who that was served and added went to the meet the team, who went to the gallery, who went to that office technology page. Um, you know, that pixel passes back that information so you can really see if it's working or not. And then as we go farther down the funnel to the bottom of it, as we would say, the direct response. So now we're looking for people to actually make a decision or an action that will directly link us to that end advertiser. So what are we looking for when we're tracking a direct response kind of effort? 
Um, typically, that's going to be make an appointment, contact us, um, buy something, give me your email address. So this is that last point to say, like, let's link together, let's talk. Um, and then it's up to the advertiser to ultimately, you know, take over from there. So we're going to bring these people in all the way down the funnel. But once you get to this point in the funnel, like you're really looking for those. This is the ultimate conversion, if you will, um, that that sale, the contact, the lead, the phone call, whatever it is. So this is this is when we start to hand off those uh, those digital end users that we've cultivated through this campaign off to that end advertiser. So you can see there's a number of different tactics and places to track um, on a website, and it really depends on what the effort is and which type of campaign you're running, et cetera. So really cool what you can do just from an online perspective. Um, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk about offline conversions because this is it's important for a number of reasons um one you know online conversions are very and those those pixel tracking tags very reliant on cookies and browsing history which as we all know if there's you know using private browsing or clearing your cache or your cookies you know that all gets erased every you know two weeks to 30 days or however often people do it so you start to lose out, you know, the audiences churn a lot faster. Um, with offline conversions, you know, we have a more robust and a more physical kind of link to that end user. And so many of you have probably heard us talk about device ID and foot traffic attribution, but um, I mentioned this before in this presentation, but all of our phones these days have apps full of location services, whether it's a navigation app or like a Grubhub that's going to deliver you some food or you're tracking like a jog or a bike ride, you know, you name it, like almost over half the apps have some kind of location services enabled. And when you click agree after you download those apps and you probably don't read the fine print, many of them say, you know, that they will share your location and your device ID and a timestamp with the marketing cloud. Um, and that sounds kind of scary and like Big Brother 1984 Orwellian scariness, but it's actually really awesome in, in regards that, you know, you're, everyone is going to be served ads online. And so if we're able to harness some more relevant information, um, more robust signals about what their behavior and interests are, we can actually deliver a much more relevant ad experience and actually tell you, did that person come to your store after they engaged with your ad? whether they clicked on your ad or not, or, you know, they may have never been to your website, but then, you know, we're walking around downtown and saw the store and, you know, either subconsciously or consciously remembering your brand, going into that store, going to purchase that thing, getting them through the door. Hey, so, hey Adam, yep. real quick. So we got a question here and, and we have a couple. So Christopher, I'll, I'll touch on your question. Um, on, on the conversions towards the end here in the Q&A section. Uh, but we have another about how far can we look back? Six months or is there a limit on the look back here on this foot traffic attribution? There is a limit. Um, and the reason there's a limit is a, there's a couple actually. The main reason is that, you know, the, the older the a data point is, the less relevant it becomes. Um, a device ID is typically going to stay with the user for you know, one and a half to two years. How, how often do you get a new phone? Unless you're some kind of, you know, really tech savvy, quote unquote, hacker type person who really wants to like, you know, crack into their phone and change the device ID. Most people don't know that it exists, don't know how to change it. So you, that actually stays with you for a really long time, especially compared to a cookie, which people have the ability to clear rather easily. So from that perspective, we always recommend, you know, the shorter time frame from now looking back is better, but also because of the massive amounts of data that are collected in this database for the United States, for example, um, we'll keep data on a rolling 12 month basis. Um, you know, we're ingesting terabytes every single day. Um, so there's also a lot of, you know, mechanics and logistics and cost associated with storing that amount of data. And so it doesn't, we found that it really isn't relevant in most cases to keep data that's past 12 months. And in some cases, if it makes sense, we can definitely go mine that data back out. But as far as, you know, making it streamlined and scalable, um, we recommend back to six months with, uh, with knowing that you can go back to 12 months 
And then anything beyond that, you know, it's going to be a more of a custom, you know, execution. You know, anything is possible with enough time and money, which is a cliche that I love. But, you know, as a best practice, you want to look at six months as your kind of, um, you know, ideal window to have the most relevant audience. And then, you know, back to 12 months um, beyond that, if you need to, especially for events and things, if you're targeting people that are at a certain event, it's important to be able to go back past six months. Um, so like I said, these are taking advantage of location services. Look at all those apps look, using location services. You know, Apple Watch Faces, Cartwheel. There's free flashlight apps that are using your location. And you're like, why is this flashlight app using my location? Well, that's because it was free and you're actually paying for it by sharing your data with the marketing cloud. Um, so unless you turn off all of your location services, you will probably sh be sharing your information um, and be put into an audience, which hopefully will lead to a relevant advertiser and user experience for you. And that's, um, that, that is what drives all of this. And Adam, that's just as simple as something like, how does Uber find you when you request a ride? Exactly, yeah. And, and like I said, this leads to some really cool reporting. This is called point of interest attribution. So this is a type of conversion. It's not web-based. Like you could have an advertiser who can't place a pixel or they, they literally might not have a website theoretically um, or hypothetically, but they do have a brick and mortar, um, you know, a little, a little boutique clothing store and they don't have e-commerce or even a website yet, but you can actually track who came to their store by looking at those mobile device ID location histories. And the reporting that comes with it is really cool. It, it says, you know, how many unique responders there were how many total visits and that can tell you how many repeat visitors you had you kind of get a breakdown by day of the week so we see in this example this is a downtown denver brewery near coors field there where the rockies play um you know friday and saturday were the biggest days of the week those are kind of like the you know it's the weekend everyone's partying downtown so you can kind of validate the audience that way as well through this get some really cool analytics you see there's an audience response by city and zip code. And that's, that's really telling us where those people came from, um, from where they lived. So this is, you know, by looking at these mobile location histories, we can actually see where they go spend every night. And then we know where they live and we can tie that to a lot of um, really valuable information for, you know, comparing that matchback reporting, for example, you know, you have the address of everyone who bought a car, we can link that to their device ID by seeing their device ID living at that address enough times to know, you know, with enough confidence, okay, that person lives here, um, you know, mark that as a conversion. So you can see how far people are traveling from their home to your business through this technology, as well as how effective your marketing campaign is. So a lot of really cool analytics come out of that device ID point of interest attribution. And one, and we did get a quick question here, Adam, and we've been getting a number of questions and we'll try to answer them at the end. We just have a handful more of slides to go through here. Uh, but, you know, somebody asked, hey, we've been very successful in a number of verticals with device ID and point of interest attribution. How can this continue with the lack of large groups such as sporting events, concerts, et cetera? Um, you know, for me, one of the things that, that I would say is, you know, if, if you work with that seller and already, you know, talk to your account manager. Um, it's a, it's a, something that they are tackling every single day. There's some really unique ways that you can start to track, you know, um, how people are engaging with the business without that foot traffic attribution, if that's something that's been hit harder on, on the, um, you know, pandemic side. Um, and I'm not sure if you have anything to, to add to that, uh, Mr. Schaffner, but I, I would recommend talking to your account manager as they have some great ideas on that. Yeah, um, just a little to add. I think, you know, we will see a little bit of a shift from, you know, the verticals we'd go after, you know, before March and now, you know, there's definitely a shift in where people are going physically to purchase things or look at things. Um, and we have a lot of really great data and information on how to go after those businesses. Um, and you're, totally a great point because you might see, you know, as an absolute value, a less, less of, you know, fewer records, I should say, entering these physical locations. Um, but we're still able to look back in time enough to build really awesome first party audiences from that data. Um, which we didn't really get into, but you know, you can build some really cool custom behavioral audiences that are not cookie based or web based 
Um, but that's how I like to think of that technology. You're picking, you know, who is at these locations during these timeframes and you have a, a custom first party audience for that advertiser that they are serving mobile ads to. And that's really valuable, even without the foot traffic attribution piece. And you will see that volume decrease absolutely because everyone's staying at home. It makes perfect sense. Um, but it's still a very valuable uh, tool because everyone is just spending more time on their phone um, or their laptop browsing. Um, so it's, you know, we, all, we will see shifts and changes, but talk to your account manager, like Adam Lee said, um, they have so much cool um, collateral and information about which kind of verticals and businesses to go after. And we're constantly monitoring that and trying to provide some education around, you know, who to go after and, and how to go after them. And, and lastly, this is called location lift. This is something else that's really, really cool that you can do um, with attribution. And this is actually tied to, you know, I think the best use case is tying attribution to a newspaper ad. So um, we can, like I said, knowing where all of these mobile devices live, we can associate a residential address with those mobile devices. So um, on the flip side of that, if you can provide a list of addresses, like a subscriber list, everyone that subscribes to a newspaper or a cable subscription, uh, we can convert those to device IDs. Um, and actually without running any digital ads, start to do that foot traffic attribution and track that over time to a brick and mortar location to see, okay, here, before we ran this print ad, how many of our print subscribers were coming into the pizza shop? And then we run an ad or two for a couple months what is the lift in our subscriber base coming into the pizza shop before and after we ran the advertisement? And, and it shows that we always see a really strong lift and it's really valuable for helping print advertisers, you know, show the value of print um, in, a, in a time when online is really taking over as we all know. So just, this is another just really cool. This is really on the, you know, the forefront or the cutting edge of what people are doing out there but there's so many different ways that we can use this technology to show value and bring value to those advertisers. So um, definitely anything, I know there's a lot of questions and we'll try to get through those, um, but we will for sure follow up with you guys after this and um, put our contact info here. So if there's anything we don't get to, um, we can connect with you and your teams to go more in depth on that later on. Absolutely. And, and thanks, Adam. That's so cool. Somebody coming from the publishing background like myself, you know, there's been such a shift in how you can track, you know, the efficacy of, um, you know, the advertising within the owned and operated platforms. And, you know, it's just really exciting because we all know how big of an impact those those ads do make. Um, I'm going to cruise through this just because we're running a little short on time, but just a couple other places that you can really get some additional info on your campaigns, even if, you know, you don't have all the pixels down that you want, you know, report stop marketing uh, is a place that we go to every single day on, on tech and Labs. So, you know, it's giving us great information on what is and isn't working, where people are engaging with the campaign and how we can optimize our campaigns to be better. Um, and so you don't always have to have all the pixels down to get informed, uh, you know, to, to make informed decisions off of data and analytics. And the last thing that, that I'll mention here is, you know, GA. We've mentioned GA a few times. Um, I think it's more important here to go to the next section, which is common pitfalls. Um, and that'll answer some of the questions that I see Christopher asking. Um, but, you know, the one thing that I'll mention on GA is that it's just super important that it's set up properly. And I think, you know, over time, a business can almost Frankenstein their GA where, you know, one person adds this and then that and then this and then that. And then, you know, five years down the road, it's like, whoa, you know, it's like a garage. Like we've just been throwing stuff in here for years. You know, we got to clean it out. So, you know, we on the tech and lab side, make sure when we start a new engagement that the GA is tracking everything properly and that we're not duplicating any efforts and that we're getting clean data that can truly inform decisions that are very important to, you know, your business. Um, so a couple common pitfalls here, uh, you know, we, we discussed earlier the inability for an advertiser to, to place the pixel easily. That's something that our teams, we try to do that on behalf of our clients sometimes. Um, you know, we try to provide 
you know, as much uh, content and instructions on, you know, step-by-step, -step, here's how to place those, those pixels. Um, I know that's something that, you know, Adam and, and uh, you know, your team deal with on a pretty regular basis. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing to see how often an advertiser doesn't know how to log in to edit their website or get in touch with the person who built their website. Um, so it's, it's really important to, you know, in, in the beginning of your conversations, just make sure that you can get that access or that they can in order to get these placed or else you just lose out on so much valuable information that comes from that. So, and, and there's a lot of different reasons that, you know, there could be problems, even if you do have access, you know, um, if they're using a templated website, for example, that doesn't allow you to edit the HTML, well, that's really common. Um, you know, sometimes uh, certain third party plugins like a, a ticket sale or a purchase won't allow you to put a JavaScript tag. So then you have to go get a custom static image tag. You know, there are just such a, it's such a number of different ways that this can create drag. So the further ahead of a campaign start you get um, in front of this, the better. So you have that time to, you know, work through like, okay, who edits the website? Can they place it? Did they place it correctly? Did they, you know, put in an additional space or a tab in the code that made it break or try to wrap some kind of McAfee security wrapper around it? You know, there's all kinds of things we've encountered that, you know, make this not work. Mm -hmm. So the earlier you can get in front of that and get that pixel placed, um, the better. Not only for just troubleshooting and making sure that it's firing correctly and collecting data on the ad server side, but also if you're doing a retargeting effort, the longer you have it down on a site, the larger of a pool of users you'll be able to leverage for site retargeting, which um, we always see a much higher engagement and conversion rate on versus other advertising tactics. So it's absolutely a valuable piece of any campaign. And so the better it can be, um, you know, the more value you'll be able to show. So the earlier, the better, um, get in front of it. And, and there's not one, way to do it because there's just different types of websites, different templates. Um, so really it's important to have this conversation early on to make sure that this isn't going to be something that delays the start of a campaign or that you start a campaign without collecting this and just kind of losing out on that for the first however long it takes. No doubt. Yeah, that's a great point, Adam. And I just from experience and, you know, we all know that, you know, we want all the revenue all the time. And oftentimes there's those quick turnarounds. But, you know, if you set things up properly on the front end and maybe take an extra day or two to do so, it's going to pay off, um, you know, exponentially on the back end because you're going to be able to provide that great data and insight to your clients um, on the campaigns that you've run for them. So do it right. Um, and, and, you know, on the GA side, as I just mentioned, you know, it's just really important that everything's set up properly. Um, Christopher, one of your questions is, you know, uh, uh, in regards to revenue tracking through a cart experience, is it all about tracking the thank you page or the entire cart journey? Um, and then you also ask about having 100 clicks, um, but, but way more conversions than that. So can one person fire multiple conversions? And that all goes with setup. So you want to make sure that you know, you're tracking things properly. Uh, you know, if there is a way, depending on your site setup, to track that, that cart journey, you know, from entering information to check out to the thank you page, we want to we wanna check every single step. And typically, you're going to see that stair step down slowly. Um, you know, you're going to have 100 people and then 75 and then 50 actually check out and you get the thank you page. And then that's where you can, you know, segment that data and run a truly um, valuable retargeting campaign to those that put something in a cart but didn't check out. So, you know, the it all somewhat depends on the, on the client site and what's possible. But at the end of the day, the more you can track, the better. It just gives you more tools to bring that valuable audience back in. And, you know, depending on how you are tracking your conversions, um, you could have 100 clicks, but more conversions. And I think it's really important to understand what you're tracking, deduplicate some of those measures that you have on your site. And that's something that my team on Tech and Labs, you know, works with our clients on every single day to make sure that what you're tracking is truly valuable to the business and you're not getting bad information or data that is making you make decisions that, that aren't accurate or truly, um, you know, aren't, aren't helping move your business forward. 
Um, the last thing I'd say is that, um, you know, you, you don't want to have paralysis by analysis. You know, you don't want to have 3000 data points, you know, tr keep it simple, um, track the important stuff. And, and that's again, all stuff that, that, you know, um, at cell runner tech and labs can help you with. Um, and Kevin, I'll get to your question here right at the end. Um, but quick, quick success story. You know, we work with a baby accessory company. Um, they do, you know, a ton of business um, on, in the e-commerce space. And when we took them over, you know, the first thing that we did was we audited everything, their GA, their traffic, all their reports from their prior agency, um, platform by platform reports. And what we found was that their budgets were misallocated. They were spending way too much in one platform, not nearly enough in another. And we needed to come in and right size where they were spending their money um, and we were able to do that through all the data tracking and analytics that they had um, activated, you know, within their site and within their marketing campaigns. And so, you know, by being able to analyze that data and truly understand what it was telling us, um, you know, we were able to move things around and see huge revenue growth. Um, increased conversion rates, increase in new users because we're going after now more highly qualified audiences. Um, we're making things more efficient, taking out that gray area, um, decreasing, uh, you know, cost per transaction, um, you know, increasing those conversion rates. And, and so, you know, there is immense power to this. And so you want to collect it, you want to analyze it, but most importantly, you want to put it to work for your business because that's why the data is there. Um, we have had a couple questions, but I know Adam, you know, there's one thing that we wanted to touch on here. We only have a couple minutes left, but um, briefly wanted to touch on, you know, a cookieless future. And that's a question we, we got earlier. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Chef? You know, it's, it's a really interesting conversation that's happening. You'll, you'll read about this in the news if you haven't already. Uh, but Google is planning to deprecate cookies in the Chrome browser by 2021. Um, and Chrome is one of the most common web browsers out there, one of the most popular. So as you could imagine, this could possibly upset the Apple cart as so much of what happens on the digital marketing side um, is relying on cookies, everything from behavioral targeting, demographic targeting, conversion tracking, site analytics, all cookie based, right? Um, and, and really, you know, it's, it's something that can sound scary at first, um, but know that everyone in the space is not going to just sit back and let that happen without doing anything about it. Um, and the partners we work with, the Trade Desk, um, even Google, even Facebook, nobody wants this change to kind of take away the value um, of advertising because advertising is really what drives um, the content on the web as we know it. Um, so without that revenue, all of those players, you know, have a stake in the game. No, no, none of them want this to happen. And, and what we're seeing is a lot of innovation um, and a lot of really cool, um, you know, different ways to effectively perform the same or better relevant end user experiences, delivering those really relevant advertisements to the end user. Um, it's really just the back end technology that'll change, you know, where, whereas it's all cookie based, it's constantly evolving. Anyway, the cookie is one of the oldest forms of technology that's still being used today. Um, and there's a number of reasons why it's not the best. Um, so there's, you know, for example, the trade desk, uh, who is our favorite demand side platform, they're actually trying to spearhead an open source identifier that will behave a lot like a cookie. Um, but it's not a cookie, but it'll still, you know, as far as like trying to find an audience, it's using a different universal identifier, um, just technically is not a cookie. And I know every third party data, like company out there, Experian, Data Alliance, Oracle, everyone is working on cookie list solutions. Um, you know, we talked about that device ID and that foot traffic attribution, that's completely cookie -less. Um, when you're doing email, that's completely cookie list. You know, there's all these different methods, but um, I think the message that I, I would want to convey to everyone is that there's no reason to panic. And it's just really, you know, work with partners who are embracing that change and, um, and that new technology and, uh, and will shepherd you through it. Um, you know, there might be changes in nomenclature 
different, you know, things that have to be done to websites, but that's the way it's always been. So you always, you know, it's always going to evolve and change. And, um, you know, it's not going to just all of a sudden like destroy an amazing industry that's kind of driving the whole internet, honestly. Yeah. And, and Adam, that's, uh, you know, I know on Tech and Labs, we're actually excited about this, you know, technology revolution that's happening because of this. Um, but I'll tell you, not nearly as excited as I was to do this webinar with you. Um, always a pleasure, my friend. Uh, it's great learning stuff from you every single time we do this. Hopefully, um, you know, the folks that joined today, we appreciate it. And hopefully you guys, you guys uh, got something out of it. Um, we did have a couple questions that we were unable to get to due to time. I apologize about that. Uh, we can certainly help you once this webinar is over. Um, so uh, we will try to reach out to you individually and get those questions answered. We'll also send out this webinar to make sure that uh, you have the recording if you want to pass it along to somebody else on, on your staff. So with that, uh, Schaffner, thank you so much. It was great doing this with you, pal. Likewise, it's been an absolute pleasure, Adam. And, and thank you to everyone who joined. We know you're super busy and it, it means a lot that you'll take some time out of your day to hang out with us and listen to us talk about conversions and tracking. So follow up if you have any questions um, that we didn't get to and we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks guys. Have a great day. <laughs>